Blessed Jesus, I love your name. I love your name. Jesus, blessed Jesus, there is no other name I know. Hallelujah. Jesus, oh, blessed Jesus. Oh, yes, I love your name. There is no other way. 
Jesus Christ, the Son of God. I'm in love with Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Are you in love with Jesus Christ? I'm in love with Jesus Christ. Are you in love with Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ, Are you in love? Jesus 
another session of this great program. It's been a very great time of fellowship, a time of exciting revelations and ministrations, and we are set and in for another of his type. This moment, we are going to hear another wonderful information, even the truth of our very God. Before then, we're going to sing from our songbook, song number 160. Take time to be holy. Speak oft with thy Lord. Abide in him always and feed on his word. Make friends of God's children. Help those who are weak, forgetting in nothing his blessing to seek. Take time to be holy. The world rushes on. Spend much time in secret with Jesus alone. By looking to Jesus, like him thou shalt be. Thy friends in thy conduct, his likeness shall see. Take time to be holy. Let him be thy guide. And run not before him, whatever be tied. In joy or in sorrow, still follow thy Lord. And looking to Jesus, still trust in his word. Take time to be holy. Be calm in thy soul. Each thought and each temper beneath his control. 
thus led by his spirit to fountains of love, thou soon shalt be fitted for service above. Father, we thank you once again for the privilege of belonging to this great movement, being among the few, having access to your presence. Thank you for the messages that have been delivered and for the things you accomplish through those messages. For your word said that the word you have sent out cannot come back to you void. But it must prosper in those things you have sent it and accomplish your purpose. And so, Lord, I know that a lot of work has been done 
in the lives of the participants of this great program. And this is another moment of some divine work. Lord, in glory, you know how brief the time is. You know that the church age is about to wind up because you are in charge of that program. And you know that there is no time that in church age that we need to have the manifestation of your love more than now. There is no time the church should be filled, blooming with divine love more than now, seeing that in a moment it will be over and that the kingdom of darkness is fighting Terribly resisting. And it is just by your love that we are able to conquer. Therefore, Lord, as we speak this day, let your spirit take your word and minister to all your people. Gentling love in every heart. Such that by the time the message is over, the work of the Lord will have been done. And love will be bubbling in every heart. In the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for answering my prayers. Take control over every contrary power in the places that your people are gathered. Lord, I search the locations with your eyes and I render impotent every contrary spirit. Everything that will be inimical to the reception of the message. Be thou bound hands and feet in the name of Jesus. Holy Ghost, brood upon your congregation and bless your people superlatively today. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. And amen. amen. Please be seated. Welcome to this session. And uh, as I said at the beginning, it's going to be a great session because we are going to handle, we are going to talk on a very vital experience. An experience that nobody can afford not to enjoy at this end of the church age. But before then, let's take a very brief recap of the messages so far. After the introductory message, we are made to understand that the theme of the program, which says the transformation that must precede the translation. And we can be described this way. As in the secular, you hear of some billionaires setting up um, some machineries to take people out of this planet to go to the next planet called Mars. And there is a, a, a program or project going on now on how to carry people from this planet Earth to Mars. A journey that will take between 80 days and 150 days. And uh, to do that, a lot of things have to be done. And the people that will be in that trip must have to prepare. They can't just pick somebody by the street when the rocket or spaceship is ready and put the person into that rocket and then say, come, travel with us. Anybody that must travel must be prepared. And so we said that is a picture of what God wants to do. There is a translocation. There is a movement from planet Earth to heaven that will take place very soon. And people that must be in that chariot that will take the people must be prepared. In the secular, anybody not prepared you put into such a spaceship, the person cannot survive. There is some fitness exercises and many things that will be done to keep the people healthy, strong enough to withstand the stress of the journey. So spiritually, the people that must be translated, people that must be relocated, must likewise be prepared. And we saw that that relocation is coming very soon. The signs our Lord Jesus mentioned and the ones revealed in the book of Revelation are all pointing to the fact that that relocation is just around the corner. Then we look at the second point, the necessity of transformation. 
they need to prepare to have your person ready for that flight. And we said the major thing is that in that flight, we are going to meet God. We are going to God's own city, God's own planet. And that God is a holy God. He will not accept anything that defiles. Secondly, when we go to that city, we are going to wed Jesus Christ, who is the bridegroom. And Jesus Christ will not accept anybody that is defiled. That means that anybody that wants to go in that flight must be free of defilement. I must have other preparations, which preparations we will see in the course of the meeting. And we say that the first preparation is that there must be regeneration to become a new creation. The journey is for only new creation. Natural men cannot board that flight. People that are not recreated cannot board that flight. And that recreation that makes somebody a new creation takes place through salvation experience. The person repents of his sins. And then by the working of the Spirit of God, the person becomes a new creation. And it is only such new creations that can understand what we talk about the kingdom of God. John's Gospel chapter 3. Verse number three, Jesus said even to Nicodemus, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he shall not see the kingdom of God. Except a man be born again, except a man be born anew, except a man be recreated, he shall not see the kingdom of God. The word see there is a, Hebrew, a Greek word, idol. It has to do with knowledge. He shall not have knowledge. He shall not have perception of the operations of the kingdom. The things of God's kingdom will remain alien to him. Today in the society, you hear a lot of people who don't have this experience commenting about Christianity, commenting about how church should be. And then they will be bringing out human mind, human philosophy. All those are simply ignorant. Jesus said, you can't know about the principles of the kingdom. You can't know what God is planning except you are recreated, except you become a new creation. So the person receives the passport to be a citizen as a citizen of God's kingdom. After that first experience, it is an experience. An experience is an occurrence or occurrence or event that leaves behind a mark, leaves behind an impression. When it takes place, impression will be there that it has taken place. And the impression is freedom from sin. In Romans chapter 6, verse number 14. Romans chapter 6 and verse... Number 14, sin shall not have dominion over you because you are not under the law but under grace. When you are a new creation, you enjoy the grace of God, the influence of God, the ability of God to be a citizen of his, to be a son of his. And sin will no longer have dominion, will no longer rule over you. In other words, you can now resist the temptations that have been flooring you. But that is just the beginning. There are still some other things to be done to you. Uh, some other transformation, some other metamorphosis, drastic changes that must take place in your life. As you are preparing to be among those that will be taken away in that flight. And we are looking at today a second experience called circumcision of heart. After the new creation experience, then you must seek a circumcision of the heart. Now, turning as our text, Leviticus chapter 20. Leviticus chapter 20, verses 7 and 8. Leviticus chapter 20, verses 7 and 8. Sanctify yourselves therefore and be ye holy, for I am the Lord your God. 
and you shall keep my statutes and do them. I am the Lord which sanctify you. Sanctify yourself. I am the Lord which sanctify you. Your responsibility, my responsibility. Stated there. In Deuteronomy chapter number 10. Deuteronomy chapter number 10. I'm reading verse number 12 through verse number 16. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verses 12 through 16. And now, Israel, what does the Lord thy God require of thee? But to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul. To keep the commandments of the Lord and his status which I command thee this day for thy good. Behold, the heaven and the heaven of heavens is the Lord's thy God. And the earth also with all that therein is. Only the Lord had re delight in thy fathers to love them. And he chose thy seed after them, even you above all people, as it is this day. Verse 16. Circumcise therefore the first skin of your heart, and be no more stiff necked. Here the Lord said, Show Israel what he expects of them. He expects that they should love him, they should fear him, they should keep his commandment, they should walk in his ways. The prescriptions he has given them about how to live, they should follow it, keeping his commandment for their own good. Then ultimately, he said, circumcise your heart. They circumcise the foreskin of your heart. Remove the foreskin of your heart and be no more stiff-necked. We are going to come back to this as we read, read chapter number 30. Verses 5 and 6 of the same Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 5 and 6. And the Lord thy God will bring thee into the land which thy fathers possessed. And thou shalt possess it, and he will do thee good, and multiply thee above thy fathers. And the Lord thy God will circumcise thy heart. And the heart of thy seed, to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul, that thou mayest live. Here he mentions again, this time he, God, will do the circumcision. And when that happens, there will now be love for the Lord in the heart. In the first, which he encouraged the people to do, or enjoyed the people to do, when that is done, they will no longer be stiff-necked. But he didn't say you have love. There's a duty to do and there's one for God. When God does his own, there will be love for God bubbling in the heart. And finally, under our text, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. From verse 22 through 24. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. Verses 22 through 24. Abstain from all appearance of evil. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. Again, in this text, there is a responsibility upon the man, upon the individual, the believer, to abstain from all appearance of evil. Anything that looks like evil, whether it is evil or not, but it has an appearance of evil, abstain from it, dissociate from it. If it is purely evil, you can't have anything to do with it. But if it appears, don't identify. 
if you want the Lord to do the work, you must dissociate from all appearance of evil. That means nothing evil must be associated with you. Then he made a prayer. The God will, the God of peace will sanctify you, separate you, purify you completely. Spirit, soul, and body. The three components of your person. The three components of your being. The spirit man, that is the real you. The soul, the realm of the heart, the realm of the mind, the seat of your emotion, the seat of your volition, your willpower, the seat of your choice making, where you make your choice, the seat of your affection, from where affection flows, the seat of your perception, all are in the soul. That soul should be sanctified or can be sanctified. And then your physical body, the outer tabernacle, such that spirit, soul, and body, you are blameless. To join the chariot, you must be blameless. There must not be any wrinkle in your spirit man, in your soul, or on your body. So Paul prayed that these believers be made holy, be sanctified, totally, spirit, soul, and body. And today we are going to see by God's grace within the ambits of time we have to see what happens when that sanctification takes place. It is called circumcision of hearts. There are people that don't want to hear about holiness. They will prefer messages on power. Messages on healing, deliverance, breakthrough. Once it is holiness, they develop cold feet. There are people that have this flair or this inclination to resist anything that looks tough or difficult. They want things that are easy. In fact, some ministers will say, these people that preach on holiness and perfection, don't you see that such doctrines will make you not to be happy because you can never be perfect. So your conscience will be blaming you for your failures. As a result, they prefer messages that will make people feel all right. Even if they do wrong, their consciences will not condemn them. They will not have conviction. They want to live in fool's paradise. Such are the people that Apostle Paul spoke about in 2 Timothy chapter 4. They are not perturbed by their carnal manifestations. They are happy with the searing of their conscience. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul wrote to Timothy and said, verses 2 and 3, verses 2 to 4, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own laws shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. Paul told Timothy, be instant, be urgent, speak hard, speak fine, give them sound word, because a time is coming when people won't want sound word again. When they will want such words that they like. The things that make them happy. The things that make them relax in sin. And then the stories they are told are all fables. They are told this and that. They don't need to fear. Fables. Say it, maintain the sound word. There are people who maybe belong to our ministry, the watchman. Who are saying, give us new, new things. We want new, new things. New, new things. One they heard about salvation. They say, okay, next one be sanctification. Next one, Holy Ghost baptism. And as a result, it is the same thing. But such people don't understand the principles of the kingdom. The Lord Jesus said that a scribe that is instructed in the kingdom 
out of him comes forth both new and old. So when we come for such a gathering, you are going to have some measure of old diet to refresh memories and to let those who are new, who don't know about it, to also have it. You are also going to have new things. So you don't switch off because of you have understood, you have seen the line of thought of the ministrations coming. You need to pay attention. Somebody rejecting God's word will not make God's word not to be effective. In Romans chapter 3, verse number 3. Romans chapter 3 and verse 3. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? If somebody didn't believe what God said because he wants something cheaper, shall his unbelief about principles of righteousness, about God's standard, will it make God to change his standard because he didn't believe? So if you are in this ministry where the sound gospel is given, where the truth of God's word is harvested and uh, di distributed, take hold of this truth. Take hold of this truth. Don't allow any distraction. In the course of the message, we are going to look at three points. One, the concept of inherited depravity. To bring out that message, circumcision of hearts, we are going to look at first the idea, the concept of inherited depravity. After that, we look at the crisis of the uncircumcised. The crisis, the kind of life of crisis, spiritual crisis, that the uncircumcised goes through. And then we will conclude with the cruise, C-R-U-I-S-E, in circumcision of heart or sanctification. The cruise, how smoothly you glide, how smoothly you glide, you flow when you enjoy circumcision of heart. It is an experience, and we define experience as an occurrence which leaves an impression. So when this circumcision of heart takes place, it will leave behind an impression that you cannot forget. It will leave behind a testimony that shows that you have got the experience. So let's go to the first point. The concept of inherited depravity. Remember, we have read the scriptures where God commanded the people, circumcise your heart. As we read in Deuteronomy chapter 10. There is something in circumcision, the foreskin is removed. The foreskin of the male is cut off. That foreskin wasn't put there by that child. That child was born with that foreskin. As a matter of inheritance, something that he came with by whatever mechanism brought about his existence. So that child was not responsible for that foreskin. And then that child, when born, after eight days, that foreskin is removed. That is some illustration of also what happens spiritually. There is a foreskin, spiritual foreskin of the heart, which we are calling today inbred sin or inherited depravity. Inherited. It came down from our forebears. It came down from our ancestors. It really began with Adam. The scriptures reveal that the sin nature that we have today was inherited from Adam after his fall. In Genesis chapter 5. Genesis chapter 5. I'm reading verses 1 through 3. It will show us how Adam was created and then what became of those that came after him. This is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God, made he him. Male and female created he them. And blessed them and called their name Adam in the day when they were created. 
And Adam lived 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness after his image and called his name Seth. Adam and Eve, they were originally called Adam. There was no separation. When they were made, they were made in God's holy image. They were made in the likeness of God. Pure image, spiritual purity. But when they fell, that image was distorted. And they fell before they had any offspring. So the offspring that came forth from them had inherited that distorted image. That was why Cain had to kill his brother. If Cain was born immaculate, he wouldn't have had that distorted image. So he killed his brother. His brother went off, he went off too. Then a more responsible person was born, called Seth, in the line of Adam. And it was told us clearly that Seth was born in the image of Adam, not in the image of God. That new image, that distorted image, that was the image transferred to Seth. And ever since then, all men have picked up the image of Adam from conception. So David had this to say in Psalm 51, verse number 5. Psalm 51 and verse 5. Behold, I was shaped in iniquity. And in sin did my mother conceive me. I was shaped in iniquity. In iniquity. In sin did my mother conceive me. So right there in the womb, I was in an environment of sin. So man, from that time, began to transact with sin. And Jeremiah, in some of his passages, spoke a likewise of the manifestation of this horrible depravity. Jeremiah chapter number 10. Let's read quickly verse 23. Jeremiah chapter 10, verse number 23. O oh Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not a man that walketh to direct his steps. Lord, you know that man is completely incapacitated. That something is behind whatever man does. Something beyond the ability of man. In chapter 13, verse number 23. Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Then may he also do good that are accustomed to do evil. To Egypt, to Israelites, they are accustomed to doing evil. Can they do good? To man born in sin, he is accustomed to do evil. Can he do good? The way the Ethiopian cannot change his skin and the leopard cannot change his spot. So also is man unable to do right. In chapter 17, verse number 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? The heart is fraudulent. The heart is crooked above all things. Who can know it? Who can know it? Desperately wicked. Incurably wicked. Man cannot cure the state of his heart. The wickedness in his heart. By his might or strength. That is what is being relayed there. And in Romans chapter 5, Paul informed in the same line, Romans chapter 5, verse number 12. We are for as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. And in verse number 19, for as by one man disobedient. One man's disobedience, many we are made sinners. So, by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. By the disobedience of Adam, many we are made sinners. Born with the nature of sin. A sinner is one that makes practice of sin. And people make practice of sin because of the nature of sin in them. So, by Adam, all the offspring became habitual sinners. 
there is the transmission of that depravity. It is that sin nature that the believer in Christ must battle if that believer must optimally perform. If the new creation must fulfill his purpose, must accomplish his purpose, he will need to deal with that sin nature. The new creation takes place in the spirit. It is the spirit man that is recreated. The new creation doesn't affect the soul and the body. It is a spirit-based transformation. There is the soul. There is the outer body. They need to be attended to. At new creation or new birth, the spirit man is transformed and returned back to God's nature. That's a new creature. But the soul and the body need to be given attention. And so, in this circumcision of the heart, not of the spirit, circumcision of the heart, the heart is the soul. There is a change that will make the person much better and more prepared to enter into the chariot. So, the physical, the manifestations of the inbred sin will always want to hinder the new creation from performing. In chapter 6 of Romans and verse 6. Romans chapter 6 and verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. By what has happened in the spirit man, we shouldn't serve sin. But you'll find that along the line, sin will begin to prop up. So he wants the new creation to know that he should not serve sin. Verses 11 to 13. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye may obey it in the loss thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Here he gives somebody a method of overcoming that depravity. A method of fighting that depravity is, is by reckoning yourself, by estimating yourself to have died, by telling yourself, supposing that you have died, so, the impulses of sin shouldn't touch me. A dead man does not respond to any impulse. If you bring fire and place on a dead man, that dead man will not feel that fire. So, you reckon yourself to be dead. When the impulses come, you say, I am dead. I don't respond. And by so doing, those impulses will not overrun you. But it will be a fight. It will be a resistance. It will be coming. And you are standing and reckoning and resisting. That is what will be happening through life. So that is one of the ways. But the way we are going to show you is a very fast way. A very fast method. A very sure method. In this way, you don't yield. In this one mentioned, you don't yield yourself, your members. When the old man rises, you say, no, I will not commit this sin. I will not allow myself to lose my testimony. I cannot do this evil. But the flesh is saying, go on. And you say, Get, God forbids. I have power above sin. And so I shouldn't bring myself down to do this evil thing. You didn't yield yourself. You rather yield your members to righteousness. That which is right in the sight of God. So the old man will keep on popping up left and right. In verse 19. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. 
In this case, as you in time past, before you became a new creation, you yielded yourself, your members, to the impulses of sin. Right now, yield those members to doing those things that are right in God's sight and being holy. Verse 20, for when we were servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. When you are yielding yourself to sin, you did not go after righteousness. Now that you are in the plan of the righteous God, you shouldn't yield yourself to sin. When you were in sin, you didn't do right. Now that you are in the family of the righteous, don't yield yourself to sin. Now, we go to the second point. The crisis of the uncircumcised. What happens in the way of those who are new creation creatures, but they have not allowed this experience to take place? In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Hebrews chapter number 12. Verse number one, we are for seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. In the preceding chapter, there was a litany of faith heroes. And then here he says, those faith heroes are witnesses that will challenge us or condemn us if we didn't perform. Then he proceeded that we should now lay aside every load. Load you are carrying that will prevent you from functioning maximally. Lay it aside. And then the sin which doth so easily beset. Talking to people who are already new creatures. They are already new creation. They have the born again experience. Yet, there is besetting sin. The sin that doth so easily beset. That word beset, if you check the Greek word, it has to do with a competitor thwarting the athlete in all directions. A competitor twatting the athlete wants to go this way, that competitor stands. Wants to go left, stands front. He wants to go back. So the competitor is not able to perform because of the twatting of that agent. That is the picture of the sin that does so easily be set. It makes the person un unhappy. I have done it again. This anger, I couldn't control. I have done it again. This irritability. I'm a child of God. They know me as a child of God. But I've shown aggression, irritability. And then the people are talking again. Oh, this way I have eaten. After eating, I can't read the Bible again. It is just sleeping, sleeping, sleeping. And the person is always confessing sin of gluttony. It is a besetting sin. Lie has propped out again. And the person told the lie. After telling that lie, the conscience said, you have told the lie again. This being beset by sin of lying. He says, those sins that beset, we should point, throw them out. There are sins that do beset the uncircumcised. It can be hatred. It can be malice. And the person is carrying grudge in the heart. Wanting to any evil that happens to that his enemy, in quote, he will say that serves him right. That serves her right. Those are sins that beset. They are standing on the way of the person, preventing the person from performing, from advancing. This is the foreskin. Remember that the foreskin was not put there by the child. The child was born with the foreskin. It is like something came out with him from the womb. This foreskin also of the spirit man is from Adam. After the salvation experience, the person becomes a new creation. 
Many times the testimony of eruption of unpleasant expressions come. Testimony of eruption of unpleasant expressions come. And that was a kind that Apostle Paul narrated in Romans chapter 7. He wants to do something good, but he's not able to do that good thing. Rather, he finds himself doing what he didn't want to do. Romans chapter 7, verses 18 through 24. Romans chapter 7, from verse 18. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For the will is present with me. But how to perform that which is good, I find not. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I will do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? That is the lamentation of the uncircumcised. Or any person who is religious but not born again. It will be happening too. I want to do good. I want to fast. I want to stay through the night. But I find myself eating plenty. And then when I finish eating, I'm not able to do that good again. I want to do so and so. But I see something in me resisting me from doing that thing. And instead of the good I want to do, I see myself doing bad. And then he said, who shall deliver? I am wretched. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? We explain that this body of this death is a term for the corpse that is tied to a criminal of old. A criminal has done something and killed somebody. That person's body is tied to him. And then the person cannot escape from that body. That body decays and the, effluve, the, the decay of that uh, corpse will begin to choke this person until he dies. That is what he used to describe the inbred sin. This inherited depravity. It is like that carcass of a man tied to a criminal. So, the individual is a new creation. But this thing is now hampering his activity, preventing him from functioning. He said, oh, wretched man that I am. A new creature said, I am a wretched man. It is a big obstacle to the functioning of the new creation. And the duration you stay in that circumstance of this fight with besetting sin is a function of your knowledge of the way out. There is an exit. The more you know about the exit, the shorter you stay in that condition. The more you know about how to do out, escape from that, the shorter you stay. And there are two major ways of getting out of it. One is called progressive sanctification, in which the person is consuming the word of God. If the challenge he has is anger, it goes to eat God's word that is talking about anger. That will neutralize anger. After a while, you will find that that word of God will bring that anger down. But that word of God that dealt with anger may not attack any other challenge, sinful challenge that you also have. So you find another scripture addressing that other challenge. The challenge of immorality, lusting. The challenge of hatred. The challenge of jealousy. You are addressing them one by one with scriptures. If you are able to consistently do that, you will seemingly reduce, bring down the potency of the old man. The potency of this inherited depravity. In 
Psalm number 119. Psalm 119. Psalm 119, verse 9. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Verse 11. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. So the word of God that you consume, you meditate on, you muse on, that word will hamper, will bring down the oppression of the old man. That word will rise up whenever the old man wants to rise. So you are going to stop all those manifestations of those canalities if you consume the word. In chapter 1 of that psalm, verses 1 and 2. Psalm 1, verses 1 and 2. Blessed is a man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor seated in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Verse 3. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. When you consume the word, the word will go to silence the old man. The old man is not dead. He is not eliminated. But the efficacy of the word will pull him down. Just as if there is a reptile, a dangerous reptile that comes into a house and you have a very thick carpet. If you cover that carpet, that reptile with that carpet, that reptile will remain under that carpet without causing any harm. That is how God's word will challenge the power of the old man and keep it at bay. But if you stop consuming the word, it will rise up again. That is just one way. But the way we are addressing today called circumcision of heart is the most effective way. The circumcision of heart. It is the most effective way. And anybody that goes that way goes into success. Ezekiel chapter 36. This case is instantaneous cutting off of that foreskin of the heart. In Ezekiel chapter 36, let's read from verse 25. Ezekiel 36. From verse number 25. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you. And ye shall be clean from all your filthiness. And from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you. And a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away this stony heart out of your flesh. And I will give you an heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you shall keep my judgments and do them. To Israel, backsliding Israel, people of God, not doing what God wants them to do. God said, I am going to cleanse you. Use water and purify you. Then I will do something in your heart. I will deal with that root responsible for your yeah, you, you, are, you are stubbornness, responsible for the evils you have been doing. I will deal with that root and change that heart from being stony and stiff-necked to a heart of flesh that any way I push it or touch it, it will yield. So that what God told the people of Israel and then the prophets, the prophets, Isaiah had the encounter. In the sixth chapter of Isaiah, he said in that year that King Uzziah died, he had an experience. His eyes were opened to see the glory of the person he was representing. To see the holiness of the person he was representing. And then he lamented, I am a man of unclean lips. In the midst of a people of unclean lips. I, the prophet, ah, my mouth is unclean. All this while, I have been rebuking the people, thinking that the problem is with them alone. But now I see that myself and themselves are the same. I am not qualified for the ministry. In Isaiah chapter 6, verse number 6, Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken from the tongue from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, 
this had touched thy lips, and thy iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Verse 8 says, Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. The man that had been rebuking the people for evil now saw the glory of whom he represented and said, myself and they are all alike. I am not qualified. We are all in the same shoes. And then an experience came his way, a symbolic touch from a seraphim. And then an awareness came as the seraphim announced that your guilt has been taken away. There was guilt in the prophet. Probably remembering how he has overspoken, made some overstatements while rebuking the people. Used some harsh words that we are not edifying or gracious in the course of reproving them. He saw all of the iniquity that had been manifesting in him. But now he was touched. He said, I can now go. That is, he had a circumcision. That touch of the angel was a circumcision that transformed him. In the present time, just as we read in Deuteronomy chapter 30, the Lord thy God will circumcise thy heart. When he circumcises thy heart, you will now love him. In the present dispensation, when this circumcision of heart takes place, the spirit of God releases his grace upon that believer's heart. And that heart is purified, is made holy. And at that same time, the love of God explodes. Permit me to use that expression. The love of God explodes in that heart and exhausts that heart to begin to follow after the way of God. Once there is love for God, there will be the expression of implicit obedience. Any love without implicit obedience to God's commandment is not the love of God. So when the person has been treated by this dose of divine grace, that heart is purified, that soul is purified, and then that person is exalted in unwavering love for God. Unwavering. There are people that say, pressure came and then I backslid. When the love of God is unwavering, it's not possible to backslide. It's not possible to think about going back to sin. It's not possible to deny Christ when the love of God is functional. So unwavering love is given, put into that heart. And then that person begins to enjoy a clean heart. In the course of our speech, we have said, the soul is the seat of the affection, of the emotion, of the will, of the volition, the power to will, of the choice making. That is the seat. So if that seat is clean, everything that emanates there will be clean. What you will be willing, what you want to do will be in line with God's word. No longer what you want people to like. Your choice will be in line with God's word. No longer choosing based on crowd, crowd uh, many people doing it and then you join them. When that heart has been purged, your affection that comes out from you will be pure. There will be no sinful affection. There will be no lusting. Cannot come out from that heart. Everything that proceeds from that heart will be pure. So, with that one stone, two billion bears are killed. You are not praying for anger specifically. You are not praying for, uh, for bitterness. You are not, it is a blow is given from the root of the problem. And then that root is extirpated. So what comes out from that heart is now pure. No hatred. No selfishness. No offense. No taking of offense. No giving of offense. Easy to forgive people. Excusing people readily. Because it has been treated from the roots. That is why we say this is the surest way to go into glory. You are not struggling to do what is required of you. 
First John chapter 5. First John chapter 5. Verse number 3. First John chapter number 5. Verse number 3. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. His commandments are not burdensome. But people will say it is difficult. There is a minister I listened to and that was the person that was saying he doesn't believe in uh, perfection because if you are falling after perfection you'll be having condemnation. So he believes in uh, telling people once you are born again you can't be lost again. And then people are enjoying and being alright when they are committing sin. When they are manifesting carnality. But when this has taken place, those things you are struggling to, uh, to, to do, you are no longer struggling to do them. Because God's love is overwhelming. The love of God is beyond what people think. In the love of God lies all abilities. In the love of God lies joy, lies peace, lies long-suffering, lies gentleness, lies meekness, lies faith. In the love, love contains all product of the spirit. Love is God. Love is God. God is love. Love is God. That is the nature of God. So when you receive the bonus of God's nature, the things proceeding from you will be manifestations of the various attributes of God. That is what happens at circumcision. God says, I will circumcise your heart and then you will love me. The love of God is deposited or is made to explode in that heart. And the person is no longer struggling. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandment. So when there is love for God, there is the obedience to God's injunctions. There is departure from the world. Anything offensive to God will not have a place in that heart. The reason why people are worldly is that they are not God's experience. They might have become new creation, but the old man is still functional. The dross or the, the foreskin of the heart is still there. And so you talk about I, my wedding must be this and that. What they are talking about wedding is think that we have the taste of the world. I must wear maxi. I must wear a long one. I will have tail in my wedding garment. All those are because of the old man. When this experience takes place, you want to rather put a mark that will not be forgotten in the line of being very disciplined. In James, James chapter 4, verse number 4. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Don't you know that friendship with the world, having a flair for the things of the world, is hostility with God? You are being hostile to God. You bought a car, and then your head is blowing because of that car. And your heart is on, on, on that car every time. You love the world. And if you enter the car, you feel that you are, you are not in heaven. You love the world. When the love of God comes, the car will be good, but it is just a piece of metals moving on plastic or on tires. If that thing, this, if they steal it, it doesn't make any sense to you. You can't, after using that big car, you can enter a car you can enter a motorbike. And that doesn't make any meaning. Because there is no place for the world and the pride of the world. For the uncircumcised, it is problem. Troubles in church today is majorly because people are uncircumcised. The disciplinary committee is loaded with cases because people are uncircumcised. When people become circumcised, there will be no place for going to this disciplinary committee. So, we find in the people that are uncircumcised every manner of carnality. But when they submit to circumcision, they will now be able to do what God requires of them as new creation in preparation for that flight into glory. Finally, the cruise in sanctification. The cruise. 
the smooth glide, the smooth journey. The, you have been traveling by aircraft, by air. And then as the aircraft took off, after taxiing, it took off. Every place will be quiet at its ascending. But it reaches the cruising altitude, a beep. Where you will hear a beep. Then the captain will announce and tell you you can go and ease yourself and move around. It has attained a cruising height. Enough cushion of air to carry it so you cannot move around. That is how there is a cruise moving smoothly when this experience has come your way, when the circumcision has taken place. In Matthew chapter 5, verse number 8. Matthew chapter 5, verse number 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. That word pure is kataros, being free from impure admixture. Kataros. Blessed are the kataros, free from impure admixture, free from contamination, free from Corrupt desires. Corrupt desires. That heart is free from corrupt desires. Desires that heaven looks at and says, no, it's not right. Blessed is such a pure heart. For such a heart shall see God. That word see is optanomahi. It has to do with gazing at. They shall gaze at God. You are gazing at something like with eyes wide open as seeing something remarkable. The first time you saw a shooting star at night, somebody called you and said, look, 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 look. And then in that moment, you just saw that flash, bright flash. You gazed at it, wanting to see it to continue. And then it went off. That is gazing. When the heart is pure, God makes himself manifest and you'll be gazing. you see the beauty of God. you see the beauty of grace. Not when you have gone to heaven. From this earth, you begin from this earth. You gaze at God. You will see God's manifestations. Spiritual manifestations. Physical, material. In the direction that God wants to show you his greatness. You will gaze and say, wow, God, this is wonderful. The same word was used in Hebrew chapter 12. Hebrew chapter 12, verse number 14. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 14. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. That word seed here, it was the same word you see in that chapter 8 of Matthew. Chapter 5 of Matthew. See, of the normal he. Without holiness, nobody shall gaze at God. God will not manifest himself to you to gaze. That is why the people that are just preaching on prosperity alone and are not talking about right living, they can't gaze at God. That is why they can't tell people to wear anything they like. Nobody should judge them by their outward appearance. They can't. When God shows himself, you will see that God should be feared. Apart from being feared as a father, God is a destroyer. He's a killer. And so you don't tamper with him. God will make you know who he is. That he is not your colleague. And then he will show you his ability. Holiness gives you, gives you access into the recesses of God's love. The love of God is shown to you. Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. The seeing is from now, not just in glory. And we are saying that this circumcision of heart is what empowers you to lead a holy life. And when you begin to live a holy life, the Lord will manifest himself to you. What is the basis of this circumcision? The basis of circumcision of heart is that Jesus spilled his blood, released his life. He died, spilled his life. That is the basis that God will give you this experience so that you can live free of sin. Ephesians chapter 5 from verse 25. Tells husband to love their wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. That he may present the church to himself. A glorious church. A splendid church. Not having spot or wrinkle. He died so that church will be glorious. And church is made up of different temples. Each person a temple. Come together to be the church. If anybody is corrupt, he has corrupted the church. 
So Jesus died that every member of the church be pure. And this experience pushes you or launches you into that state of purity. And the man can readily overlook his wife. He is no longer counting. The other day you did this. It's because you have not got this experience. You will not be counting on her flaws. You won't be debating. You did it, I did that. All those debating is because of pride. Only by pride comes contention. That's what God's word says. Proverbs 13. I think verse 10 or verse 20. Only by pride comes contention. So once there is contention, pride is the chairman. If one of you is sanctified, there will be no contention in the house. If one of the partners is sanctified, there will be no contention. The only thing is that the sanctified will be bearing the youth, the load of the unsanctified partner. But there will be no contention. In Hebrew chapter 10, it is Jesus that paid the price. By the which will, we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. We are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus, through the giving out of his life. Chapter 13 of Hebrew, verse number 12. We are for Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. So his own blood, in the blood of the flesh, is the life thereof. So Jesus' life was in his blood. He gave his blood so that there can be life. There can be beauty. There can be glory. Basics, death of Jesus. How do I acquire this experience? It is through consecration and prayers of faith from a yearning heart. God said, as we read in Leviticus chapter 10, sanctify yourself. I am the Lord that sanctifies you. So, sanctify yourself means consecrate yourself unto me. Separate yourself unto me. When you do that, I will not give you the lasting experience. And then in 2 Thessalonians that we read, 1 Thessalonians chapter, 15, chapter 5 that we read, it says, abstain from all appearance of evil. Where you abstain, you are separated unto God. And then the very God of peace will now give you that supernatural transformation of spirit, soul, and body, making everything holy. And that God is faithful. He is capable and he will not fail. Romans chapter 12, Paul said, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. That means the way a sacrifice is brought to the altar and it doesn't jump out of the altar when they put fire. That is how you should come to me. Any tribulation or trial that comes your way, you remain stuck to me. You have life in you. A sacrifice is a life. That is how you do consecration. You consecrate to the Lord. And then you pray in faith. Counting on God's faithfulness. Because Jesus has already paid for it. And that will now yield you the experience. When the experience has come. When, manif the, when times of manifestation come your way. You will shine. When this experience of circumcision of heart has taken place, challenges will come. Time of manifestation. Every challenge you have is a time of manifestation. Just as every test they give you in class is to assess what you have, what you know. That is how God allows challenges to come for you to show forth what he has made you. And we are saying that when those challenges come, you will be manifesting like the scriptural models of Enoch. Enoch walked with God. He walked, had fellowship with God. And then he was not again. Nobody saw him again. He saw Methuselah, didn't see him again. All the relatives didn't see him again. They might have looked around everywhere. They never saw him again. Because God took him the first flight. The flight into glory. He was relocated. Other models include Joseph. Joseph, the young man, whose mistress came and said, come and sit by my, come and lie with me. And he wouldn't. Come and stay by my side. He wouldn't. And then she came to force him. He said, mistress, madam, 
I, everything in this house is committed into my hands except you. I can't do this wickedness against God. I can't do this wickedness against God. And she wanted to bravely and boldly take him and he escaped. That is a testimony. He manifested what was within him. That is a model of sanctification. Many people will have said, God, you understand, and yielded themselves to sin and ended their destiny as maybe senior, senior house boy. But that thing he did made God, gave him kudos and took him to glory. Glory in office. And when his brother that sold him came to the office, he didn't say, okay, it is now my turn. It is now my turn. You can see how it is now with me. He said, no, don't feel condemned. Don't worry, don't worry. I have forgiven you. I didn't even get offended because I have come to see that your evil was used by God to save us all. Feel free with me. When sanctification takes place, there's no vengeance. There's no setting of trap for anybody. Somebody does you evil, you don't set trap for him to do back. Joseph wouldn't do back. People like Samuel, a minister, called the people and said, I call God and the, prophet and the king as witness. Any of you here, can any of you lay accusing finger at me that I took his oxen or his ass or I took bribe from him and twisted judgment or I oppressed him because of position or I did anything harmful to him because I am in charge. Let that person say, and I'll make restitution. And they said, no. That is a testimony of a minister. When the minister is sanctified, that will be his blamelessness testimony. When sanctified, you will be like Daniel, who will not identify with what others are doing, because others are doing it. He said, he proposed in his heart that he will not defile himself with the meat of the king. The meat, people are looking for to eat. They brought to him and said, it is unclean. It is against the word of my God. Even though my God allowed me to be carried into captivity, but I still remain allegiance to him. I mean, allegiance to him. I can't eat the unclean. The Hebrew boys were challenged when they were reported to Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar came diplomatically and said, Oh, these are fine men because they are among the leaders. They are among those that we are, uh, indu uh, uh, that we are inducted into leadership. They are among those that we are taking as eunuchs. So these three young, fine young men, you know, it can't be them. And they came to them gently and said, What did I hear? I don't want to believe it. I want you to prove the people that reported that they are wrong as the instruments of music are rendered. I want you to bow and let them be ashamed. But if you don't bow, then I will cast you into the furnace of fire. And they said, we are not careful to answer you on Nebuchadnezzar on this issue. Our God is able. You said, let me see that God that will save you. Our God is able to save us. But if he chooses not to save us, we will stay bow to your image. That is a sanctified heart. The visage of Nebuchadnezzar changed, but they didn't shake their ground. They didn't shake. They didn't say, let's not hear. It's not sad. Let's change. Let's reconsider. They stood their ground. Paul the apostle was a sanctified heart. And the people of Thessalonica watched him observed him and because of his life the men of Thessalonica followed the gospel followed the message and became models for other churches to follow that is sanctified when you are sanctified you will become a city set on a hill and you are washed and people draw from you sanctified hearts beneficiaries enjoy perpetual love for God God's love will be in abundance, will be blossoming, will be blooming. The grace of God will be available. The things commanded you to do because of grace you are able to do. So the commandment of God will be said not to be burdensome. Sanctification guarantees a seat in the chariot of relocation. A seat is guaranteed once you get sanctified because it will keep you away from all the rubbish. 
you are saying, ah, I am overrun and overwhelmed by masturbation. When the sanctification, circumcision of heart has taken place, masturbation cannot rear its ugly head anymore. The root has been taken away. Sanctification can be developed, grown. After you have got the experience, you grow it through eating the word. The more you eat the word, the greater that grace grows. The more you walk with God, get involved in exercises, the greater that grace grows. And uh, it is a definite experience. We want to pray now, but there is need for you to do self-appraiser. Because there are three categories of people listening now. One category a people that are sanctified and by God's grace, they are living in sanctification. Their prayer would be, Lord, I want it to grow. Until I become like Jesus, I won't stop growing. Second group are people that was we are sanctified, but today they have lost the sanctification experience. They had the experience on, but it has gone. And the third group are those who have never had it. As you look inwards now and questions are thrown at you, you will know if you are. We have shown that our sanctification, the, the, the root of sin is pulled out. The first skin that was inherited is excised. That work is done in the soul. The heart is pure and the things that proceed from the heart are clean. Clean thoughts. No room for, encounter, for taking in negative thoughts, thought of anger, thought of vengeance, immoral thoughts. No room for that because the thought line is pure. The thought is pure. Everything that is seated, emanating from the soul is pure. Now, check up. Is there God's love in your heart? The love that makes a man Make no room for disobedience to God. Or is it rather the love of the world? Love for fashion? You need fashion, change of clothes. Every day, clothes, 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 clothes. Every day, property, property, property. Every day, money, money, money. Is that your own love? If that is your love, you need this touch. Check, assess yourself. Music you enjoy. The Christ, so-called Christian music, it is rather disco. That is what you sing. Those are the things you hum at. But the taste is worldly. It is what you enjoy. When that sanctification, that circumcision takes place, interest in anything that looks like the world goes. Is there pride in the heart? Pride as a result of who you are. What you have attained. The money. The success in business or position in society. And as a result, you feel exalted in your heart. You esteem yourself highly. That is pride. Once pride is there, circumcision has not taken place. When circumcised, the nature of Jesus of lowliness may have monetary power, may have authority, may have connections, but the person will remain lowly. That is a touch in the heart. Is there hatred, the lusting, or any of those diseases of the mind? Hatred, bitterness, vengeance, implacability. All of them are manifestations of an unhealthy heart. What about suspicion? You suspect people. If two people are talking, you say they're talking about you. Or you are selfish. Everything revolves around you. If you're not going to get benefit from that thing, you want it to work. Selfishness. Or there is craftiness. You are crafty. You can tell lies. You can deceive people. Though you are born again. Though you are a new creation. But you still maintain all those ungodly characteristics. You are an exaggerator. You exaggerate. You can tell lies. You can freely say what is not true. Or you enjoy self-pity. When you're on your own, you are crying. You are crying and saying this kind of word. And you are weeping every night. You are weeping. Self-pity. All of them are manifestations of a corrupt heart. When the heart is circumcised, faith comes there. When faith is there, there is no self-pity. No self-pity. Faith in God will not permit self-pity. So, look in words. Do you crave for unclean material? 
unclean material, pornographic material. Or you use your handset and you assess pornographic material. Or the one that are written in paper. You, you, after fellowship, you go home and then you open and begin. It's because of the uncleanness of your soul. When it becomes pure, when that circumcision has taken place, those things will look horrible. You look at it, you take it away. It's dirty. Those things that you derive pleasure in, or you have fear of the future, fear of the future, fear of human beings, fear of your future, any fear bubbling in your heart is because you are not yet circumcised. Jesus says, don't worry about tomorrow. Anxiety, worry. All of them are works of the flesh, manifestations of carnality. How is your marriage? Even the woman that is wanting to say divorce. Time for divorce, time for divorce. When you become circumcised, you are not seeking divorce. You are praying for your life partner to get transformed. It's time to pray. The singles praying for God's will are not giving God conditions. They are not giving God conditions. They are saying, God, let your will be done. I, will, I don't want to please my parents. I want to please the Almighty. People that do hanky panky business, they are not circumcised in the heart. The purity of heart will not permit any appearance of evil. Remember, they were told, abstain from all appearance of evil. Strive in the church, strive at home. Conscience. Condemning and convicting every time. Because of the wrongs being done. Are all indications that you need this circumcision. You get irritated. And then you explode in rot. You need this touch. When this touch comes, your seat of emotion has been cleansed. You have control of your emotion. The seat of emotion is cleansed. You have control of your emotion. No more rot. You are easily irritated. That irritability is checked. You, will still have, you can still get angry, but anger will not last. It will be under control because the grace is flowing. The love is flowing. Circumcision of hearts releases bullets of love. Divine loves begin to function in that life. The grace of God is flowing and the person is able to do what the scriptures command or demand. Thank you, great father. You see the pride in the heart of the young woman? You see the pride in the heart of the young man? He is successful and then he is exalted in his heart because he needs his touch. She is successful and then she is oh, full of herself because she needs his touch. Lord, I am praying for all your people. I am praying for all your people, all your people. That have found themselves needy, have found themselves in need of divine surgery. Divine surgery. The removal of the foreskin of the heart that will leave behind functional love. Love of functioning, love in abundance, love that is the very nature of God, blossoming and bubbling. Dear Father, I pray, I pray that such people will receive that touch as you did in the day of Isaiah. As you did to that prophet who was ignorant of his wretchedness. Lord, as you did to Apostle Paul who ah, cried out, Oh, wretched man that I am. The next verse says, thanks to Jesus. Jesus did the work and the man became sanctified. Blessed Father, I pray that your mighty hand will go around every soul and do that which you alone can do. As they resolve, as they resolve to separate themselves unto you, to consecrate and desire this experience, this event that will leave behind a remarkable impression. As they desire it, Lord, thou that giveth and upbraideth not, let it be done by your mighty hand that the church may be pure. That the matters we hear of in the church every day between brother and brother, sister and sister, brother and sister, husband and wife, people and their pastors will be a thing of the past in preparation for the journey that is imminent. 
Have your way, blessed Father. Remember, Jesus said it is finished. Remember, Jesus gave his life that your people that you have chosen may be sanctified. Lord, pick them up. Purify. Purge them of that old man. Excise that foreskin of the heart and cause them to love you. Cause them to enjoy super abundant love. The love that when functional cannot be hampered by tribulation, cannot be hampered by persecution, by affliction that will make a man ready to die for Jesus. Lord, let that love come into every soul. In the name of Jesus, thank you, my Father and my God. As they continue until there is an awareness, let your mighty presence surround them. Surround them. Brood upon them. And do that work perfectly and permanently. That your spirit of power can rest super abundantly. For it is written, he loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, his God, has anointed him with the oil of gladness above his fellows. Purge and cause your people to love righteousness and then visit with a deluge of your power. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, the offer of our prayers. Glory and honor. Wisdom and thanksgiving, dominion, excellency, and power. Be ascribed unto you now and forever. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.